I have one minute. Oh. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Um, how are you guys doing? Oh, come on. I need some energy. I had a jet lag, and if you guys don't give me some energy, I'm going to fall asleep in five minutes on this, on this stage. So, how are you guys this morning? You got to say, like, amazing, like, you know, the you know, keynote from the NEC guys. Amazing, right? So uh, my name is Simon Chung. I'm from Yahoo. And I'm here today to tell you my life story over the last two years running this crazy bare metal clusters that uh, we have running up for our production system. So just in case you don't know who Yahoo is, um, <laughs> I guess, you know, some parts of the world maybe not. Um, so, you know, we're, hit the, we're focused on, you know, trying to make the world's daily habit inspiring and entertaining. We have over a billion users across desktop and mobile combined. Um, and we've made our bet, bet to move all our compute resources to OpenStack, whether it's VM or bare metal. Uh, our goal is similar to Yahoo Japan as well, is basically put an API in front of uh, all our compute resources, and we're able to fully automate in a, uh, spin up and shut down of uh, resources quickly and easily um, in an automated fashion. So managing OpenStack bare metal hasn't been easy um, because we're running really, really old software. We're still running the Grizzly version of uh, OpenStack. And you can see um, we started VMs a long time, way before our bare metal. And you can see from this growth is um, the bare metal actually uh, in May earlier this year has eclipsed the instances that we have in uh, VM, so uh, it's actually grown a lot faster, and that has led some due to some serious uh, scalability issues that we haven't seen in our VM installation. Um, sorry for the graph with no scale. <laughs> you know, I can't give you the specific numbers, but all I can say it's in the tens of thousands of VM, you know, um, tens of thousands of bare metal, and just not surprising we have so much bare metal. Given, um, you know, we have 30 plus clusters uh, in six regions uh, globally to run all this. And we have actually, you know, we are traditionally a bare metal shop to begin with. So we have hundreds and thousands of bare metal that we're trying to get into OpenStack. So, you know, for the time being, we will have way more bare metal. But, you know, we are having projects and efforts trying to move everything into uh, VMs, wherever it's possible, we're getting our developers to migrate the application into VMs. So um, I'm not sure how many of you here from Vancouver, if you heard about the talk from James Penick from uh, six months ago. So I'm mean, here, this kind of follow up, I just want to give an update where we're at with, with that. So one of the things that we had challenge with because we're running Grizzly, um, the imports are starting to take longer and longer. Um, in fact, one node took about seven minutes to be imported and to be made available, and that was going to take a long, long time. And I always joke, it's not in my lifetime when we get all of Yahoo so, um, inventory into uh, OpenStack. So I said, so we kind of took a pause on the migration for now um, because uh, you know, the software uh, is not scaling and we we don't want to invest more in it, and we want to move to Ironic. And given the timeline is so close now, we're going to invest all our efforts into getting Ironic going, um, which is running. We're going to be running the Juno version, and pretty soon, sometime this quarter, we're going to go to that. So after we move to Ironic, we're going to resume again and start migrating all those hardware into Ironic. So um, before I describe some of the challenges and learnings. I'm just going to go through our bare metal uh, deployment architecture. So in the OpenStack control plane, we have uh, we run OpenStack Grizzly. We have API nodes. So we have multiple API nodes running Nova APIs, Keystone, Nova Scheduler, and Nova Network. With the Nova Network and Nova Scheduler, we actually only run a single instance. And we have scripts to uh, work with Zookeeper to check uh, which one is the primary one and only start up one instance of that to process. So we also have MySQL database in uh, two, two MySQL database running in dual master single rider mode. 
and we run RabbitMQ in a cluster of uh, two, two to three hosts. And we also run uh, Nova Compute, which we call the bare metal controller node in multiple hosts as well. And we have put in a patch for HA. So um, initially it was one BMC will handle half of our nodes, another BMC will handle the other half. And when one goes down, we basically lose management to that. So we put in a patch now, it actually automatically fails over and picks that up. So as part of our OpenStack system, we also have to deal with our internal uh, systems like DNS, which uh, will update the, the names and host names. And we also have internal uh, configuration management database where we store all our hardware information. And this works with an imaging, uh, proprietary imaging system that basically looks for um, a flag in our configuration database and, re uh, and works on re imaging the host. So the BMC uh, computer also talks to the power management API, which to tell uh, reboot the box. And when this happens, if the box reboots, it pixie boots to get the um, pixie information from the proprietary imaging service that we have and then images itself and then updates the imaging service that is done. And that in turn updates the BMC controller saying, hey, this node is booted up and then it goes active from there. So next I want to describe a bit about a bare metal lifecycle that we have at Yahoo. So our users you know, start with, they order this uh, the hardware that they want through a, an ordering system. And this system gets uh, purchased, uh, data center ops, rack and stack this host, and uh, add them to our uh, internal CMDB system. From there, we have an uh, inventory importer script that actually talks to the ordering system and also uh, CMDB, and then combine, uh, collects all that information, and it creates an uh, open stack bare metal inventory. And then sets the quota for the users. So from there, the, the user is able to do a Nova boot by interacting with uh, OpenStack, and it puts this host into an in-use state. And from there, they're able to SSH into the host and use the host for whatever they want to use it with. And the next thing is, while well, it's in-use state, the users have a uh, couple of options. They could say, hey, I don't want this host anymore. They can Nova delete, and that gets returned to the bare metal uh, pool. <coughs> Another thing that they have, we have implemented is break fix is that users can say, hey, uh, this hardware that I have has uh, hard drive issues or memory issues. I really, I don't want it anymore. And they do a Nova break fix, and that gets thrown into another queue that gets processed later. So I'll explain a bit more about that in the later slides. And then they can go off, and then because they get the quota back, they, they can Nova boot a new host from there. So after some time, you know, after the host may be really old, warranties expired, and the data center ops, we, we want to start collecting these old hosts and uh, you know, sell them off or do something with them, like no longer use because they take up too much power in the data center or so, whatever. So we have this retirement process, so we take it out of the stack and then another system will go through that retire the host. And then another way the hardware gets into the system is the horizontal migration that we talked about earlier. Um, that would basically take the inventory, existing inventory, doesn't image the host or anything and just add them uh, straight to the in use state and quota for the users. So next, so challenges that we have run into. So we didn't have quota per available zone um, support. So I'm not sure you guys understand what that means is um, the, the hardware that we have, when you Nova boot, you usually just give it a flavor. And because the way our data, our data center is in, um, mapped out, we have backplane security zones, and when the, the IP is private or public, and because we're still also running a Nova network, Neutron, so all the host is installed with a fixed IP, so it's kind of like just um, no sitting in the data center and we have to have to map. So what happened is that, you know, we didn't have this support in Grizzly, so the users end up saying, hey, Nova Boot, this flavor, and they would say, oh, cool, you know, I've ordered a machine in private IP in some security zone, and they would 
get a host that's maybe a public IP instead of private, and then they will get uh, a different security zone. So uh, in corp instead of like see, uh, the DMZ. So you know it's totally not what they expected. Some may not even notice that because it's yeah it's just so wrong. So and this have this led to quarter discrepancies, which means uh, if a user one user ordered ten hosts that's in private IP, another host. Another user ordered 10 hosts in public IP, and the person that's booting up say, hey, I don't really care. I'm booting it because it's private. I'm just booting everything up, and they may get five hosts in private and five hosts in public. So, and they, they're happily running along using their hosts, no problem. The guy with, that ordered 10 public IPs because they, they're hosting some service that needs to talk to the outside world will say, hey, where's my host? I can only find five. The other five is gone. Like, you know, so they start complaining and then you know, we didn't realize this when we initially launched and then the quota dispersion came along and yeah, it was a real headache. So the solution that we implemented, we started using aggregates to define the availability zones and also we apply quota per availability zone and custom scheduler to be able to schedule those uh, hosts from the availability zone. And probably about three months of my life just combing through all the database, all the inventory imported transactions, try to reconstruct this, who ordered what, where they booted up, and in cases, you know, talk to the customer and say, hey, can you please delete your host <laughs> so I can give it back to someone else that ordered it? So it was crazy. <laughs> Many sleepless nights as well. So the quota per every zone uh, implementation is the aggregates. We have um, defined some of the name like priv, BP, like backplane one, with single or multi IP and a security zone. And when the user says Nova Quota Show, what they get is a flavor and the availability zone, and then they have allocation, which is the quota that's given to them, and the usage, how many of them they are booted up. So, and when they Nova boot uh, a box, they would need to specify, always give a Availability zone, and that's a um, mandatory uh, for them to, so they only get the host that they need. If they don't give this, they get no valid host. So another issue that we ran into was resource tracker. The resource tracker, I think it's an automated background job that kind of uh, pulls all the inventories and uh, collects statistics and updates the status of the host. And as we added, a, past a thousand hosts, uh, this resource tracker was getting s slower and slower to start. So one day we realized, hey, we need to restart a, the BMC node or we're doing an upgrade. And the BMC node compute process would not start up for a whole hour because it's in the background waiting for this resource tracker to uh, scan all the hosts and inventory again. So, so you know, maintenance become a nightmare. Basically, whenever you need to restart, it was just not, uh, it would take forever. So the solution is, at that time we just said, hey, let's just remove it <laughs> because we don't need it. So we implemented a more optimized direct DB call with SQL optimization and now um, the computer node just starts up automatically immediately. So uh, Ironic also has this problem today. So we have other uh, blueprints that we're tracking, trying to hopefully get similar uh, features and get that improved. <coughs> Next is Nova Quarter Show takes a long time. I'm not sure if you guys know, when your user runs Nova Quarter Show, it should usually return straight away, say, hey, this is the quota you have available. For our users, for some of the larger clusters, it, it was approaching two minutes. They would type Nova Quarter Show, it would take about two minutes before you return and say, hey, this is what you have. So uh, users were really, really annoyed <laughs> with that. Um, so we, again, put in a custom uh, quota show API uh, to be more efficient just using the DB to create the right things and we managed to reduce that from two minutes down to two and a half seconds. Um, a lot of all this work is going into the Grizzly branch so it, we're, we're not upstreaming this right now because no one should be using Grizzly. Like, I mean we had to get a system up working and to scale it and we're at a stage where we're just hacking bad stuff on old software just to get us going but all these learnings we're trying to apply to Ironic so that you know, when we launch that, we, don't, um, we won't run into the same issues. 
Another thing is Nova Boot was taking a long time. So someone would type in Nova Boot, it would take six to seven minutes before the prompt comes back saying the host is you know goes scheduling state. So you don't know uh, whether it's booting or not. So and this led to a lot of people say, hey, I got three or four hosts, they boot up, say just fine, you just wait a few minutes, you know, a couple of hours, you'll be done. And then we have customers who say, hey, I want to boot up a 2,000, 3,000 nodes or something in the next hour because we have you know, peak traffic coming. And we're like, that's not going to happen <laughs> because that would take a long time. And we would have to manually, whole team was over the whole weekend. We were booting up the host manually, bypassing OpenStack, going back to our previous imaging system. So that was painful. And for this problem, we haven't found a solution yet. Where Scale testing um, are running right now. Hopefully, we don't run into the same problem. Um, but I think at this stage, we kind of maybe just give give up on this and move on. Or you know, maybe if someone has some ideas, we can think about it. I think part of this is also because the, how we implemented the quota per AZ, we there became too many combinations of um, flavors and uh, available zones that uh, make this boot command take a long time. So another problem we ran into a lot was backend de dependencies, a system that we rely on, like uh, DNS system, uh, CMDB systems. And this led to a lot of uh, RPC timeouts in OpenStack. The DNS and CMDB was out of sync uh, with uh, OpenStack because the way the code, I don't know, somewhere we wrote it, it's basically when it fails, it just stops there and it doesn't clean up any of the dependency systems. So that made some of the nodes that was broken basically get us in and no longer available to our users. So solution, we increase the RPC timeout. But that is short term because we can't keep increasing it because each time we increase it, if there's a real problem, the users don't get feedback saying, hey, this is something wrong and they will have to Right now, we already have to wait about two hours before you know whether it's going to be in error state or not. So another thing is we've improved the code to ensure that if there's a failure, the DNS and CMDB changes are stay in sync so that uh, they don't go out of sync. And audit all the DB and correct all the inconsistencies so that the inventory will be available to the users. The other thing that we kind of was totally surprised to us was that you know, the operations team was supposed to just manage the platform. And suddenly, because we're the face of all of compute resources at Yahoo, uh, our, where issues that used to go to da data center ops around the world with you know, a much bigger team would now go all come to the first line or it's through OpenStack, and then we had to deal with all the issues that we, we were not surprised. So, and we have a lot of backlog because of that. So and that was a kind of learning that when we first launched it, we didn't realize you know, how much work there was for that. So we kind of you know, started teaching uh, side ops, uh, giving the access to OpenStack, making sure they know how the basic operations so we can hand those uh, tasks off to them. Also train them to be more proficient with OpenStack. So they're not just another part. You know, they have to be an integral part of our team to run OpenStack. OK. The other thing that, or that we ran into was the importer was taking a long time. So same thing as m migration that takes like seven minutes per host or something. Our inventory was. Uh, each time we import hosts, we would have to calculate like, the quotas and the nodes, existing nodes, and then figure out um, the metrics, uh, the mathematics to you know, how much uh, quota to get, whether we have enough quota uh, to assign uh, to a user. And it took almost an hour uh, to import, uh, say, just 10, 20 hosts. In fact, uh, it wasn't really depending on uh, the number of hosts, it was more of each time we need to do this calculation to import one host or 10 hosts, it was taking hours. So again, solution, we implemented an API uh, directly to the DB, uh, leveraged the DB to do all the calculations. And that improved the performance of uh, from hours to literally uh, minutes to import each bucket of hosts that we have from the hardware ordering system. 
Next thing is uh, boot failures. You know, hardware failure is a fact of life. You know, if you have a, one computer at home, you're lucky. If it, you know, it probably lasts you a few years, it doesn't break. But when you run you know, hundreds of thousands of hosts, they say you have 1% failure rate. 1% 1 of 100,000, that's a lot of machines. <laughs> right? So you know, the IPMI interface that we find you know, always fails a lot. And the host will get jammed, so you lose control of it. You cannot uh, remotely boot the host. So, um, so that, that translates to an error for the user, so they cannot use the node, um, and they just keep getting an error. Sometimes the host gets installed incorrectly, and the pixie boot order is wrong, so it just continues to boot to the hard drive and never gets reimaged. And then, so OpenStack fails there again. And also, Hard drive fail, so Im Im imaging holes uh, also fails, and then that causes issues. So our solution was to uh, involve the uh, data center ops more <laughs> and try to use the same tool, tool chain to make sure they can uh, use OpenStack to boot those holes, verify those holes, so that uh, you know some of the basic issues uh, that OpenStack can't talk to the host, like the PC boot order, will not be there because they have direct access to the box, they can fix it there. For us, the OpenStack team, we have to work with them you know, remotely for them to fix the host. So the other thing that we, we're gonna, we will do is you know, collect and analyze all the failures. We will try to de determine the pattern, you know, whether it's certain vendors or certain model type that we have in issues with, and try and figure out, hey, can we work with the vendors to fix some of these higher failure rates? So with all this failure, we kind of came up with this uh, synthetic boot test. By using Jenkins regularly to schedule Nova boots on the host, we, we do a Nova image list to make sure uh, OpenStack that cluster is still working. We, uh, we Nova boot and host, and then we SSH uh, and into the host and run uptime uh, just to make sure, hey, we can image the host and we can log in and use the host. And then we Nova delete to make sure we can delete it and return that to a pool. So, and that, comes up is, you know, it gives us a, you know, trend on the history of the host that we booted and how long it takes to boot. So uh, Jenkins is great for collecting the logs so we can post and analyze it and all that. And, uh, yeah. So next is Reparo. So it's, talked about break fix. So it's something that uh, our team came up with is basically to um, fix hardware easy for users. You know, it's something from Harry Potter. <laughs> and you know, it's a flick of one and everything just fixed. So for the users, yeah, you don't have to deal with data center ops. You just know the break fix and the host disappears. You get your quarter back and can boot the host. So it makes it easy for the users. So we introduced a new Nova command and API. This is a Nova break fix, instance of UUID, and a command what the problem is. This, um, we build it on task flow um, for the automation, and this is another OpenStack project. And you know, it helps smoother experience for the users dealing with hardware. Basically, they don't have to file tickets or anything. They just do Nova break fix. It decouples the break fix process from the users, so they can move on with their life. And behind the scene, asynchronously, we fix the host and re uh, return it back to the pool. So it goes like this, the process. You use Nova boots, they find an issue, they run the Nova break fix, and they get the quota back. And then they Nova boot again, and they move on. So with Ironic, the learnings and some of the future works I want to talk about. So we did some initial scale testing with Ironic. Uh, we did some benchmark using Rally, and we tested with 1,000 nodes at 200 concurrent boots. We were able to achieve 97% uh, success rate, 2% no failure, and 1% resource tracker issues. So two, no failure is you know, hardware issues, so there's nothing we could do there. We have to fix that. Um, the resource tracker issue, you know, that's some scalability issues in Ironic that we have to um, fix. So, to get us uh, to that point from the vanilla Ironic installation, we had to tune some things. So in Ironic, we are using Neutron. So the Neutron uh, server worker, we 
change that from zero to 24. The ironic conductor work will win the 500, 100 to 500, and the ironic and neutron, the SKL min pool size and max pool size was updated for 10 and 500. Oops, wrong. Okay, and the other thing that we ran into was uh, we, we updated our keystone to authenticate with our own internal uh, authentication system. And some of the service account was also using that. So every time uh, communication between, for example, uh, Novo Compute to Ironic, Ironic to Neutron, it would have to re-authenticate, get a new token, and that was hammering our internal system and things were just slowing down. So um, we're getting more times out. So um, in the short term, we've kind of just disabled that and just uh, put the authentication straight to the database. That way, um, we can uh, basically bypass that authentication and everything goes through the database. We probably uh, want to work on something that uh, makes the communication uh, cache and reuse the token so that we don't hammer the, the systems. So some of the future work that we're looking into is with the Ironic API, today it's a single worker. And you know, if you need to scale, you need more of those. So we're looking at putting it behind Apache, running in mod whiskey mode so that we can have more uh, our own, uh, APIs. We need to be, have the ability to run periodic tasks in parallel. Today, for, um, things are sequential, so uh, there are things that run, for example, like power management, uh, status polls, and updates, and, because, and that's a blocking call, so everything will get blocked behind that, and we found that, you know, we will get RPC timeout because as you boot more hosts, if you have a host that's just taking a long time, it doesn't time out um, on the power call, everything gets blocked and then everything uh, slows down and the whole thing, everything times out and things stop working really badly. So, and also, and our goal is to scale to be able to boot a thousand hosts at a time concurrently. And today we're at 200 and we're trying to get to a thousand or more. Uh, you know, I talked about the improved resource tracker. We, um, we need to make that better so that uh, we, today in Ironic, it's also what we're seeing is that it would take about uh, five to seven minutes uh, for the resource tracker uh, to start and get working. So before Nova boot, so if we restart the process, Nova boot would take would be available after five to seven minutes, and that's for a thousand holes. So obviously, if we add more, that was going to take more time. So some of the blueprints of interest: uh, ironic mul multiple compute host support. So hoping that will solve some of the issues that we have with our compute node scalability. We want to switch the periodic task to futures library. I think it's been approved as well. So um, that will help us run some of the blocking calls parallel, so that it doesn't. Uh, independent boots won't be tied up behind a single um, scheduler. Then another thing that we're looking forward to is that no IPA to conduct the communication. So today, uh, the nodes uh, talk, needs to talk to Ironic, and what happens is that, you know, that implies that you have ex network access to your control plane. So if any host gets compromised, they can you know, exploit the control plane, possibly take over, and then re-image your entire infrastructure. So you know, something that we definitely don't want happen. And uh, I think it's interest is manual cleaning. And manual cleaning this is, you know, Ironic has this automatic cleaning thing that, you know, after um, each Nova boot or delete, it will, uh, after delete, it will clean the holes, you know, make sure it's back into a good state uh, before the Nova boot for the next user. There are things that we want to do, like uh, update firmware, maybe reset the RAID drive, and maybe do something, uh, burn in test for a node that will take much longer. And we don't want that to be part of the automatic cleaning. So we need a feature to say, hey, this set of hosts are new, or the time's up, we need to you know, do some uh, manual cleaning on them. So uh, just a plug for my colleague, he, his talk on Thursday. So if you want to know how we use Neutron for Ironic, um, this is his talk. It's James sitting right here. <laughs> And let me tell you a funny story about this, this thank you slide. So I wrote a slide with all the people that are upstream contributors and all the people that help me, you know, keep me, give me all the sleepless night or mostly, you know, help me out in sleepless nights so that, you know, I don't have them. Uh, 
I was going to publicly thank them, but I, in the end, I had to delete it because after speaking to the manager, it became a hit list for you guys to hire them. So we said, no, we can't share that. But I want to thank from the bottom of my heart, you know, without our, our team back at work, you know, our life would not be so easy, my, or my life would not be so easy as an operator. And hey, if you're OpenStack Ninja and want to help us solve our problem, I would like to forward your uh, details to our hiring manager as well. So. Um, and of course, last but not least, um, you know, without all you guys, the OpenStack contributor community, OpenStack would not be where uh, it is today, and we won't be able to run our infrastructure with OpenStack. So, thank you for me, uh, listening to me rambling all for the last 30 minutes. Uh, I want to, last thing is, there's an app. You have, we have to, uh, I was asked to remind you guys to use the app to provide feedback. It will help me. And I think help the OpenStack uh, Foundation to, you know, I don't know what they do with it, maybe choose speakers or please be nice. <laughs> I, I don't want to get banned from future uh, summits and I really, you know, so I, I really want to attend the next one. So, so that's it. Um, questions and answers. If you can use the mic at the front for questions, um, that'll be great. We have about 10 minutes for questions. I think the spec renamed from zapping to clean, manual cleaning or something like that, yeah. Um, any, no questions? Was I, did you guys didn't understand what I talked about? I was really boring. <laughs> oh, I covered it really well. <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you.